When I do this presentation, I normally ride on stage on a bicycle. When I proposed that to Dagnia, he said, that's not going to be possible. And I didn't understand why it wasn't possible. Now I understand riding a bicycle here would be a big challenge, so I'm not going to do that. But the bicycle is important. The bicycle is important because it's my um, analogy, and I'm going to use it throughout this presentation. What this presentation is about uh, is about something that has been uh, by numerous speakers already hinted at, the elephant in the room, as they say, which is the world of digital that's changing our profession so much. A number of speakers have mentioned the fact that one of the reasons the old strategies don't work any longer, it's because of digital. My job, and I've been the head of digital at Ketchum for many years, my job was to teach our teams and our clients how can you still manage this process in this world that's so complex? And, and what I'm going to do, what I'm going to try to do in the next 15 to 20 minutes is take you briefly through that process to show you that there is method in this madness. So the fact that you know, there are so many things that have changed doesn't mean that we cannot manage and we should manage our reputation in this more complex world. Um, let me start with this. Um, I don't think I have to explain. Somebody cl more clever than me came up with the idea that anything that has to be said about social media can be explained with the help of a donut. So Facebook is, I like donuts, and Twitter is, um, I'm eating a donut, and so on and so forth. So most of these are, you know, fairly easy. Uh, I'm not going to... Um, trying to explain them all, but if you get to the end of the, of the slide, you see something called, now let's see if I can get this right, which means I like donuts in, in Russian. Why? Well, because if you want to do business in Russian and social media, actually the hot property to look after is Vcontact rather than Facebook, as you know. But even more so, the next one down, uh, who is, who I jian jian chen, which in Chinese means I like, pon I like donuts. Because again, in China, it's the thing there, it's called Ren Ren, um, that has uh, almost as many members as Facebook worldwide in China only. So if you want to do this. Um, what do these things, what all of these things have in common? Well, they have in common, well, of course, they are based on technology, okay? And they have donuts in common. But what else do they have in common? And what do they have in common? is us. The reason these things are so successful is because there's people, like the people here in the room, the people back home, the people that are listening to this in streaming, that are using those. So when we talk about this new digital world, what we should really talking about is the people who use these digital tools rather than focusing on the tool. And that's my first message, the first thing that I was trying to get into my my teams, you know, it's about the people. And so if you want to talk about the people, I have to feed you another foreign word, Los Latin is a Dutch word, which means let's, let's let go. Um, the picture you see on the screen is a garden that happens to be just outside my old office in Milan. And as you can see, it's a beautiful garden. Uh, there are uh, trees and grass, there are benches on the sign, which you cannot see. But somehow, the city hall planners forgot to watch how people were walking across that particular street. And so there is a path where no path was supposed to be. The message is, you don't control it. Get over it. Control is not going to come back. We lost control. I'm not talking about the future. I don't know anything about the future. I'm a very down-to-earth person. I talk about the present. And sometimes when I feel good, I talk about the past, if I can remember if I'm not drunk. You know? So the control is gone, and it's not going to come back. So we have to learn, as the Dutch say, to let go and find a way that allows us to manage while abandoning this strict iron-fisted control that we used to have on all on traditional communication. You know, there was a time where we controlled everything about communication, right? 
We control the message, we control the media, we control the very advertising, the paid for media. And if we got really pissed at a magazine that was criticizing our companies or our government, we could cut off the advertising, starve them, right? Well, big news, these people here, the people you saw on the slide with all the names, they don't need our advertising. It's frictionless media. They exist without us. Actually, they're doing better without us if we leave them alone. Yeah? So, Los Latin, remember this little word because it's important. Let me tell you a little story. Like many people here in the room, I have an American Express card. I actually had one for 33 years. I actually had an American Express card longer than I've been married, which is sort of, you know, I don't know what that says about my brand loyalty. Anyway, I have this American Express card. I actually have a, a personal card. I have a business card for business expenses, and my wife has a card. And so I happen to use my business American Express card to pay for some journalists to go to San Francisco to an event. So that resulted in an abnormally large expenditure. And so I got a call from American Express and said, hey, What's wrong? You know, you normally spend three, four hundred euros a month, and now all of a sudden we get a 5,000 bill. And uh, I thought, oh, gee, this is pretty good. They protect me from fraud. That's very thoughtful. So I told them, look, no worries. Yes, I know it's exceptionally large, but, you know, it's, everything is fine. So they say, okay, no, that's, all, that's, all, that's all we need to know. However, you should know that we have a policy. And the policy is that, given the fact that this expenditure is so out of whack with your normal spending pattern, until we receive payment, your account's going to be blocked. Which is not so nice, is it? And then she went on to explain that by my account, she meant my business card, my personal card, my wife card. That really got my attention because of the many dangerous things you can do in life. There's one thing that I advise you to try, which is getting between my wife and her credit cards. That's extremely dangerous. You know, and then uh, all of a sudden I realized I was the one that had to go back and say, my honey, you know, for the next three weeks you can't use your credit cards. I said, I don't understand this. You know, that sounds like a stupid policy. You know, my business, American Express card, is paid by Ketchum. Uh, what do I have? And she says, well, I understand, but that's a policy. There's nothing I can do. And I said, well, I think it's a stupid policy. I want to write a letter to your CEO. Can I have the name? And she gave me the name, so I wrote the letter to CEO, and I, published, and I published it on my blog, which is very popular. has about five readers in the world. Um, so I put it on my blog, uh, went home, forgot about the whole thing, following morning. I was supposed to print out the letter and send it, but forgot about it. Uh, five o'clock in the evening, I get a call, and it's somebody at American Express that says, uh, because in the letter I was complaining, and my expression for complaint was to call this policy uh, a stupid policy designed by some blockhead in a windowsless office. I was really pissed. I was really pissed. And uh, so, you know, I get this call saying, hello, I'm from American Express. I wanted to reassure you that my office has windows. <laughs> Isn't that cool? Isn't that cool? So, you know, she wanted my attention. She got my attention. I told her the story. And at the end of the conversation, she said, you're right. We're wrong. I'm giving you back your cards right now. Now, the thing that I wanted you to take away from this little story, it's not the fact that American Express has systems in place to intercept the fact that I wrote a post saying AMX sucks. That's pretty easy. Anybody can do that. The thing that I wanted you to take away is I write in English for no good reason. I don't even know why, but I write in English. Yet, somehow American Express got this message, figure out who I am, where am I, check my background, check my account, and got somebody on the phone in 24 hours to call me back with a ready-made solution. That, you need to wonder how the hell they did it in 24 hours. Yeah? So here's a, I want, I would like for all my clients to be like American Express. Okay? That's what I would like to be. And what I'm going to tell you is 
how you can design a system that you know, has the ability of giving such, such a performance. So where do we start? This, this is a, you know, anybody who's been in business school knows this. This is the, the value chain, you know, that's also called the customer journey. You know, you start for somebody that's a prospect and that's, that's how you use marketing to find the prospects. And then, you know, you draw them closer, they become sales leads. Some of them will eventually buy your product and then they become customer. That was the old world, right? How is this different? Well, it's not different, except for one little thing, which is this. Now, there is a, I'm an engineer, so this is called a retroaction ring. It means that the system can now feed back into itself with some signals. What I've just told you is a story that turns me into an advocate for American Express. Now you know the story. Maybe you're going to tell it to your friends. Maybe you're going to go back to your workplace and tell it to somebody else to see how easy it is to spread this good news. But even better when the news is bad. If I have to tell you a nice, a bad story about somebody who didn't really work well, you know, you equally could use this to, to, to talk to your friends. So the, our problem is this little box, little gray box, that feeds into our carefully engineered system and screws it up. And screws it up. So we need to deal with the fact that this exists, whether we like it or not. This very uh, busy infographic has the um, incredible merit uh, that I designed it. So you're supposed to say it's beautiful, okay? Um, and I accept tweets or Facebook messages to say, to say how beautiful that is. But the, the, the main reason, and I'm gonna briefly tell you about this, but the main reason why I'm using this infographic is to explain to my clients that even though they lost control they still have a process whereby they can manage, okay? So the fact that they lost control doesn't mean that they lost the ability to manage, and that's a demonstration of it. So let me go briefly through the various steps. And step number one, actually somebody has already talked about it. I think it was Gonzalo who said the first thing when we, we, we start a new project on country branding, we go online to find out what they're saying already. Okay, let me, let me make this statement a little bit more generic. Anything, anything that you conceivably has to say, anything, is already been talked about. You cannot invent something new. And if you do, you have no audience, which is another problem. How would you call the first guy who bought a fax machine? A pioneer? A leader? I call him a stupid. There's nobody else to send a fax to. Every person after the first one is more intelligent than the first one. Because now there are at least one, two, three. The value of X fax machine increases with every new member. The value of every single fax machine is increased. Yeah? But whatever, however arcane the problem you have to deal with. I've dealt with problems that were interesting for 500 people in a population of 200 million. And yet we could find conversations about it. So they are already talking about it, accept it for a fact. I've done hundreds of those projects and I can tell you that you cannot come up with something that they're not talking about. Now the question about the fact that they're talking about and means that there's already conversation going. And you need to find out what this conversation is about. Now, let me make another example, which is something nobody in this room would do. Let's say you're in a bar, and uh, I and Christophe are talking about our holidays in Greece and how we want to take holidays in Greece. And you, what's your name? Marcus. Marcus. You come in the room and say, enough holidays, let's talk football. You would never do that, right? And yet this is what brands do all the time. They interrupt whatever we are talking with our friends and elbowing the way they trying to make us pay attention to whatever they have to say. Yeah? In real life, nobody would do that. Okay? 
So number, step number one is about understanding what the conversation is about. And when I understand what the conversation is about, and I understand the fact that I and Christophe are talking about holidays, that we are talking about going in Greece, and we're talking about the food that we have in Greece. We're talking about probably beaches and sunshine and, and seaside and sailing, this sort of things. We, we sort of know it doesn't take much for human brain to understand what are the possible areas of conversation. And in fact, tonight you will be doing this in spades because you're going to be interacting with other people during cocktails. You will hear a conversation for 10 seconds and immediately you will be able to tune in. So our brain is very good at that, right? But a computer is not. A computer is stupid, so we have to teach it, you know? So that's what number one is about. Number two, oh, Number two, you use this information, and in the book you find a lot more details. We don't have the time to go through that. You use this information to design your content strategy. Content marketing is now a buzzword, meaning I can, you know, gee, I can write my own content. That's fantastic. I have no pesky journalists checking out what I write. All the conversation about propaganda was very, very interesting for me. Because in the old days, you know, we were tasked with propaganda, right? We PR people would say, hey, this is the propaganda you have to run. And we didn't worry about it because we had journalists on the other side mostly. And journalists would check out what we say. And when we say something that was not credible, they say, ah, come on, piss off that. I cannot believe. And they would not print it. So they would protect the integrity of the information that went to the public. But now that journalists are out of a job, unfortunately, um, you know, it's unfiltered, so we can produce whatever content we want. It doesn't matter, yeah? Now, what I'm suggesting here is to use this map, this reconnaissance, to decide which part of our message book we can use in which situation. So, you know, maybe a good way to interact in the conversation between me and Christophe is, okay, maybe we can talk about the time that Greece won the Euro Cup. Didn't they win the Euro Cup? Yeah, yeah, they did, did right? Yeah. So maybe that's a good way to connect to the conversation about grid. So number two, content strategy. Number three, you need a container. Now, this is interesting because a lot of my clients come to me and say, I need to, do, to redo a website. And the first question I ask them is, why? What's wrong with the current one? Yeah? A lot of digital projects fail because you start to design the container before you figure out what the content will be. And it's a typical case where form should follow function and not the other way around. So you cannot possibly design a well-performing container until you figure out what the content shall be. And that's why it's only number three. But it gets worse because then number four, number four is now you can start using Facebook. How many times have you got somebody coming and you say, oh, we need a new Facebook strategy, we need a Facebook page? And again, the question is why? Facebook is a mouthpiece. It can be a great, very effective mouthpiece, but it doesn't define the message. It doesn't define the story. It doesn't define the content. And ultimately, it should not be the ultimate destination because remember, everything you put on Facebook becomes their property. Always remember that including your pictures, including your white papers, including everything. Read the T's and C's. They, well, actually, don't read the T's and C's because they are scary. <laughs> You're never going to use Facebook again if you do. Yeah? So num number, number three is about the content. Number four is about the propagation. And now, finally, you're starting to build a community. You're starting to attract people to pay attention to you, but you do it the, the nice way. Instead of interrupting the conversation, you, men, you meld into the conversation. You join the conversation. So that, that ensures that what you have to say is relevant because it's about what they were talking about. There's nothing wrong with somebody coming into the conversation between me and Christophe and say, by the way, I've got some great deals for you to go to Greece this summer. That's relevant advertising, yeah? Uh, and finally, number six is you can start, you know, turning all this buzz into, into uh, sales leads. Now, 
I know that you know PR people, PR people don't like this conversation about sales leads because it smells a little bit too much about marketing. We are into awareness, we are into reputation. But at the end of the day, let me tell you what pays the bills is selling widgets. You know, what pays the bills for all these beautiful things is, is, is selling stuff. So, you know, we should be, we as a profession should become much more conversant with stuff like conversion rate. How good are we at turning interest and attention into potential sales leads? Now, of course, we don't sell anything, but we should be aware of how well our system performs in that, in that light. Okay, so very briefly, these are the six steps, and you know I can wax lyrical about uh, about any of the six, but you know we don't have the time to do that. But I want to tell you uh, a little bit about the team because you need some certain competencies, and it's a slightly different set of competencies which I try to describe here. Competence number one: you need Winston Churchill. You need a leader. You need somebody that knows what the hell is doing. Right? Because most of the time, the client doesn't. The company doesn't. They know they want to do something, but they don't have the big picture. Yeah? And so you need to be able to provide that sort of guidance. Because there's going to be plenty of time where something goes wrong. There's going to be plenty of time where you're drowned in data. And if you don't have somebody who has a clear understanding of the destination or where you're headed, you're going to be in trouble and the project is going to fail. Okay, so that's that's first uh, things you need. Second, you need creativity. Don't think for a second. People accuse me that I spend too much time in Germany and I try to turn everything into processes and little spreadsheets. You know, I like to measure things. But don't think for a second that you can live without creativity. Coming up with stuff that raises emotion and grabs attention is important. However. Creativity has a role, and after a while, you should rotate the creative out because now you have to work. Otherwise, you're in perennial creative mode and nothing gets accomplished. So Salvador Dali is very welcome, but after a while, please leave because now we have to work, right? The third element you need is a good project manager, which is different from the leader. It's different from the guy who runs. A project manager is somebody who understands intimately the project and knows how to read the data and is very conversant with various phases, right? And finally, last but not least, they are not in order of importance. You need somebody who knows this shit. Joe the mechanic is somebody who knows where to place the breakpoints in a Facebook form because you have to know the sort of data you're collecting and how you're going to make any use of it, right? So you need to have that capability. Now, I don't think you have one person in your organization, whether you're in agency or in-house, that have all those capabilities. Actually, I don't know anybody who has all those capabilities, so, which means that a digital project is, by definition, a team effort. You need to collect those capabilities and use them as appropriate. And that's the job of Winston Churchill up there. But finally, there is an element, there is a, there is a component, which I think is very, very important. And I'm going to try to show it with another little movie. And now to honor America and salute the men and women serving our country with our national anthem, please welcome, as voted by you, the fans, our winner of the Toyota Get the Feeling of a Star promotion, Natalie Gilbert.
reason I'm showing this, for those of you who are not basketball fans, the black guy that comes to the rescue of the little girl, this gentleman by the name of Mo Cheeks, the head coach of the Portland Trailblazers. And you probably noticed that he cannot fucking sing. He doesn't get a note right. Jesus Christ, is he bad? And yet, he does the only right thing to do at that time. Come to the rescue of the little girl, and in, even though he cannot sing, he gets the whole arena to sing along with the girl. So when I spoke about le leadership, that's the sort of stuff I meant. It doesn't mean that the leader of the team needs to be somebody who's better than anybody else in the team. And in fact, it doesn't have any importance. Your competence, your technical specific competence has nothing to do. What it's got to do is the courage of standing in front of 10,000 people and do the right thing knowing that you cannot sing. Okay? So that's the sort of leadership that we need. Now, I'm going back to the bicycle. Unfortunately, I should have, you know, this is really a shame. I should have brought a bicycle anyway. Um, I'm going back to the bicycle to say something that you're probably very familiar. You all, many of you have children. I have three kids and each of them, I taught them how to ride a bike. And, 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 and that's sort of situation I had. I had training wheels. And after a while, they grow up. And so they say, Dad, can you take out the training wheels? Because I think I can, I know how to. So you, you know, take off the training wheels. And for the first couple of hours, you hold them by the seat, right? That, that's what you do. You hold them by the seat. And after a while, they're going too fast. So you have to let them go. Will they fall? Yes. Will they kill themselves? No. You can make mistakes in social media. You can make mistakes in digital. There is no mistake that cannot be fixed with a simple, I'm sorry. I'm never going to do that again. Okay? So, my final question is, I don't know if you can write like Paul. I don't know if you can write like a little baby. But can you write like Albert Einstein? Thank you very much for the attention.